Yeah, we, um, I can go through some housekeeping items. My name is Peter Inchaptegis. I'm with the American Institute of Physics. Um, and I am on the program planning committee, so thank you everybody for attending the first session today. Um, and this morning session, if I could just get a quick check, what did you guys think of that? We, the program committee wanted to really start off with an inspirational storyteller to get everybody jazzed. Obviously, we got the right person. <laughs> Was that the right? Uh, did you guys appreciate that and get that you know, kind of energy? Pretty good. It's a good start. Okay. Yeah, that's it. No, I that's thought it was great how he did the he kept the turn to access. I know, I, I don't know if that was intentional or just like a lucky yeah, I don't lucky know, day, regardless. Right? Yeah, that's but good. yeah, regardless. All right, thank you. And what I have to uh, remind everybody this afternoon and everyone wear comfortable sh shoes because we'll be walking to the uh, Palais Montcalm for the afternoon sessions and there's apparently some cobbled streets that we'll be walking on so just be prepared for that. Um, also, the session it uh, uh, gives you. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm reading my email. Oh yeah, so okay, so if you, if you need to get your CAD or CMP uh, credits, the session does offer those. Um, we want to make sure that everyone turns off their phones eventually. Want to point out the exit right there. Uh, we won't have an emergency, but if we do, that's where it is. I uh, want to also remind everybody if you haven't downloaded the app, it's really a pretty dynamite app. I leverage it constantly, so if you can download it, that'd be great. It also gives you access to uh, evaluate the sessions. I'll also remind folks to do that. And also, this session is not being audio recorded, so I'm going to have to look at that. So, with all of that, um, again, before I begin, uh, introducing the panelists, I did want to just spend a second and share my little personal story on networking. I've been with the American Institute of Physics just two weeks. This is my third week, and I'm here in Quebec, so pretty awesome job so far. <laughs> but um, last fall, I uh, was ripped from the organization I worked at, and I immediately engaged my network. And one of the um, opportunities of that sort of presented itself was this AIP opportunity. But it went cold, and I wound up going to another organization accepting an offer. Um, and just a month ago, um, maybe a month and a half at this point, I got a, I got paid that this opportunity was sort of resurfaced itself. And I re-engaged my network, and you know, I had some anxiety. What should I do? I just accepted this job and I decided to go ahead and go for it and you know, ultimately get, get an offer so it all worked out. But through the whole process, even when I first was uh, found myself looking for an opportunity, I found that my network, not only did they um, give me leads, uh, but they also sort of gave me confidence and um, they really were there for me. And I think, you know, you, I had in the past when I was in my job used my network to uh, bounce ideas off of, get ideas from vendors, and um, you know just get some insight into how folks did their job, and I could you know sort of capture some of those moments and make so I can do my job better. But the networking for me at that moment really was more of a more than a net. It was more of a boost for me. So that's my own personal little story. Um, we do have some panelists scattered through the. Uh, audience, I do want to introduce them. We'll be pointing to them throughout the um, session. Uh, first, Betty Lawler with AICHE, uh, Anne Loaza, IFMA, uh, Matt Miller, AWS, and Mark Owen with Ashra. That's right. Ashra. That's right. Like Ashra, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, so Lowell Applebaum will be leading the uh, session today. He's with uh, Next Connection. So, Lowell, take it away. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my, first, my first association with SATS in terms of things, I was working for ASAG at the time, uh, which in the Midwest is called AE. And you go to Monterey, Mexico, they call it AJ. Uh, so I was there, and actually, Betty, who's my supervisor, sent me here. I became really enmeshed in the SES community, which led to the ASE community. 
Uh, and for me, I feel like rather than read you a bio, I'll tell you a short snippet about how networking uh, from a virtual standpoint changed my career a little bit. Uh, I was in a online dialogue about association issues that happens every Tuesday called Association Chat. Uh, and I had just gone through the renewal process for ASAE, which years ago, uh, at the time, perhaps wasn't exactly the smoothest process. And so, uh, being a little younger, uh, I was a little vocal about what that process had been like. And sure enough, the chief membership officer of ASAE, uh, from that experience, reached back out. And he said, these are great insights. How about you get involved and help fix those things, since you're voicing those insights. Uh, and so from that came a networking staff of working on volunteer committees uh, that led to a number of positions uh, that led to today volunteering um, and on the chair of the CAE commission. Uh, but it all started because of that person in person. I was a virtual networking moment of meeting someone, then introducing me to other volunteer leaders, uh, which led to learning, which led to growth, which led to positions, uh, which led to increased passion for our industry. So, forewarning and fair warning about what you're going to, what you're signing up for by being in the room. We're going to start with a little bit of background about why networking is important, but then we're actually going to go into what does networking mean across various stages uh, that have been researched and tested through some volunteer work that's been done. As you can probably guess, if we're going to be discussing networking, if I had you sit in your chairs the whole time, that would be a pretty poor form of actually learning about networking through stages. So there will be interactive activities where you will be getting up and doing things. There will be, I have a master's in education, particularly in experiential education, uh, so as much as I don't like to sound my own voice, there will be moments here where you'll be working with partners to process some of this and go through it as well. Everyone has different learning styles. So if the idea of having to get out of your seats and do things is not what you're looking for for a 10.30 session, there's no harm, no, no foul. There are a lot of great sessions going on. <laughs> if you're if you're staying in here, though, <laughs> if, if you're staying in here, though, just know. I know sometimes we get married to our seat. You break the engagement now. You're not going to be there the whole time. So, to start with, you are going to need someone to work with today. Uh, so, what I would like you is to find at your table uh, either a person, uh, a partner, a brain buddy peanut butter to your jelly. Uh, that will help challenge your mind. Uh, if it's an odd number table, you can be a triumvirate. What I'd like to do is to turn to that person. And I'll only give you two minutes, so you have 60 seconds each, to introduce yourself by telling a moment of networking that you've experienced that has changed your life. Share a quick snippet of a networking moment you've experienced that has shaped your career, or your personal life, or your journey. Find a partner. Find your right buddy, and share a quick moment of networking that she
discussion and talking about wonderful topics. Let's first take a step back and talk about why we need to talk about networking in the first place. Uh, on the premise that we are all and somehow affiliated with membership uh, focused associations, uh, our actual colloquial conversation about why people belong or why they want to join or the value they see has taken an evolutionary process over the past few decades. Uh, it used to really be initially just what are the benefits they're getting. The really long list, people still have this on their site somewhere, potentially. How long can that list be? Uh, perhaps that was at a time when you, you joined because you were told to join. It was expected, so quantity was better than quality, per se. Uh, but that evolved into the membership conversation that became, all right, what's the actual value proposition, right? What is the value behind the benefits that we're offering? The reason why someone would pay dues. The, reason and how we're going to make an impact on their life. That conversation happened for a good few years and then evolved from, all right, we can't just have one universal value proposition because not everyone needs the same thing. We actually need to have unique value propositions because if we think about the audiences we serve, someone who's early in their career and someone who's been in the field for 40 years doesn't necessarily need the same thing at the same moment. So how do we look at what we create in terms of where we're looking to make impact as an association on professionals in the field? became a unique value proposition conversation up till today when a lot of the buzz and conversation is around this concept of engagement. Meaning, you have the right offerings, they have value that they can note with them, they actually are hopefully targeted to various segments that you're deciding what those audiences are, but if people don't actually use them, it's great that you have them, but where's the actual value in that? And so if you listen in membership circles today about this conversation of engagement, uh, what I have found as I speak to various groups is that when you speak to an association, like, yes, we need to focus on engagement. We need to get more of our stakeholders, members, non-members engaged. And then you ask them what they mean by engagement, and they haven't actually had the conversation about the definition of what that engagement is. So if you want to take a fun piece of homework back and have that as a lunch and learn conversation, if you're all focused on engagement, what does that actually mean? because your publications person versus your meetings person versus your membership person are probably going to have different definitions there. If you don't have a unified theory and approach, then how are you tracking success of what you want to see? There's a purpose for all of that. So if we're talking about today, and when we're thinking about we want to see members affiliate with our organizations, and that's a conversation that consists around engagement, well then, what do we mean by engagement? And these are some of the categories they may think about. What do we mean by engagement when it comes to, let's say, learning? Is that just static attendance at a webinar? Is learning actually the participation and giving comments back? Engagement, do we mean those that are actually the subject matter experts that are sharing? What do we mean by advocacy? Is it enough just to sign on to something that you're promoting? Do they have to attend the Hill Day? Where's the engagement we want to see in these categories? certification and certificate programs so that it's not just the standalone individual moments of learning, but it's actually graded learning, right? It's stepped learning, and that helps through career stages. When we talk about engagement at meetings and conferences, registering for the conference is not the end of engagement at the conference. That's, that's the beginning of engagement at the conference. Yet if the measure of success we use is how many registrants we have, we're not actually measuring the engagement that we're looking to create at our meetings and conferences. So what do we mean when we talk about that silo and that approach? The same with volunteer opportunities. 
we all have boards, probably all have committees, but is that the only way that we're looking for people to engage with our organization? We are not Kmart, we're not Target, right? Transactions are important, but we're about the relationship that implies a two-way. So where are the other places we're looking for people to give that counts as engagement? If someone stands and helps hand out name badges, does that count? Do we create those opportunities? And the one we're really here today to talk about, colleague connections, networking. In uh, the latest membership marketing study uh, that was put out by MGI uh, last year, I know their new one is out I think today uh, for this year, the top rated value, piece of value and benefit, whether you're a trade or individual member organization, of why someone belongs, it's because of colleague connections, because of who they can meet that will serve as a resource for them, as a place they can go with problems, as a place they can go for career advancement opportunities, as a place they can go for visioning of what a career would look like and where the field is going. So if anything on here, this may not be your revenue driver, but in terms of your engagement possibility, we hear from the member voice that this is top rated time and time again. You may have other categories as well. I was just making these things. That being said, while this is a local opinion, I'll give you a volunteer tested and researched <coughs> opinion. Uh, a few years ago, uh, ASAE put together a CEO Pathways Task Force to say, what does it look like if someone's going to pursue a position in the C-suite? What do the stages of that look like? And doing a lot of research, uh, and both qualitative and some quantitative, there were four general stages that were created. So in someone's association career, uh, the first, of course, is the early stage. Whenever they enter, or as many of us do, fall in to an association yes. position, Early, right? You're just figuring out what does actually an association mean? 501c3, c6, how many acronyms do I actually need to know? Uh, what do you mean? Nonprofits actually want to make money. What do you mean by that? Aren't they a nonprofit? So the early stuff you're first starting to learn about. The next stage determined is the mid stage, which goes into the advanced stage. Uh, if we talk in CAE terms, which means you have to be at least working in the industry for five years. You're talking about someone who achieves their CAE and shortly after at that point. Uh, stage three, the master executive level, people that are more senior in the C-suite that have been serving for a while. Uh, and then fourth stage would be career search. Because whenever you start a career search, whatever stage you're in here, you're going to step out of. Because it's no longer going to be you know, learning what do I need to learn to get to the next stage, it's where do I need to know to get the job that I need to have. So these is the premise of the four stages is what we're going to focus on today. So giving you these categories of engagement, giving you these as four stages of career advancement, what I would like you to talk about for a moment with your brain buddies since I've been talking for a while. For those that just walked in, we started uh, the morning by pairing up in brain buddies. If you're sitting by someone who walked in late, please adopt them into your brain buddy ship. If you're peanut butter and jelly, they can be your marshmallow. <laughs> um, but this is what I would like you to talk about for a few minutes. As you think about either if you're within an organization, how you run that organization, or if you're an industry partner or a hotelier, the organizations that you have that work with you, either from a consulting relationship or visit your space from what you see, how are you approaching the idea of segmentation by career stage when it comes to categories of engagement? So today, how are you approaching segmentation by career stage, whether or not this is the one you use, through categories of engagement? That conversation will then be our final moment of background as we then jump into actual networking as a place of focus. All right? Take three or four minutes, talk about that question. Are you using, are you using this one, career stage, in terms of categories of engagement? Go ahead, three or four minutes to talk about that. Sorry, I can't. 
And so as we discussed networking this morning, uh, the definition that I would prefer for us to use, which doesn't have to be definitive for what you do back at home, but the definition I prefer for us to use is interactions with other people to exchange information and develop contacts, especially to further one's career. So interactions with other people to exchange information and develop contacts, especially to further one's career. And perhaps the networking that you create goes outside of that a little, but in general, I would say that's a fairly good definition about why associations focus on networking. How many people here have gotten a job in their life because of a contact they've made through networking? New York Times said, did a research study that said 80% of people, 80% of people have done so. If your association is able to set up the kind of networking experience that then has someone find a job are they going to, is that member going to feel loyalty to your organization? Yes. 
constant contacts research also says that it takes us six times of meeting someone to feel like we actually know them. So for instance, if I go up to someone and say, oh, hi, I'm Paul. Hi, Paul. <laughs> no, many. Oh, many. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully they see their name. But that, that doesn't count as a time. That, just meeting someone, getting someone's name, is not actually meeting them. And so, for us to make meaningful networking experiences, it's not just about what we typically do, which is, let's get a room, let's throw some wine and cheese in there. Good, everyone go in and meet each other. <laughs> now, now, tell me, what makes us different? Then the Kmart with targets the communities we create, right? It's because we have these amazing populations of smart people, of committed people within an industry that because you belong to our organizations, you can meet them, you can make these connections, you can make these collegial relationships that will help you for the rest of your life. And the best that we do as organizations to set that up is to give you some wine and cheese and say meet each other. <laughs> and part of that's true, Stanford University has uh, a shyness institute. There's actually a shyness institute at Stanford. Um, that says that 60% of people in the research they've done uh, admit to having severe problem with just getting past those first 10 seconds of high and not knowing how to start the conversation. You walk into the room, it feels like every other person in the room is paired off on already having conversation. Who do you talk to? Myself. <laughs> which, which could be excellent networking. <laughs> <laughs> like, sure that's good. I like that. <laughs> but, if, if, look at the research, right? Why are people joining our organizations to meet colleagues? We have the right people in the room. And then what do we as associations do to actually help make those connections meaningful? So what we want to do this morning is we're going to move through approaches to networking with a lens of those approaches through the different career stages. Because networking is not the same thing and does not carry the same purpose for each stage of your career. You could do this through a geographic lens. You could do this through a academic lens. You could do this through a discipline lens. We're doing the career stage lens this time. So the pattern is going to be, we'll start the stage. I'm going to now give you 60 to 90 seconds to do rapid fire brainstorm. And if you're going to create a bullet point list of what do you think someone whose early career needs or is looking for when it comes to networking. So you have 60 to 90 seconds, quick rapid fire with your brain buddy. What would you say are the things if they're coming to a networking experience that you believe they need? And then after you go, I've done my homework, I've made my list, and I'll share it with you mine. You there? All right, so 90, 60 to 90 seconds, bullet point list. So in early career, what do they need in networking? Go. <laughs>
Alright. Can I have your attention back, please? Can I have your attention back, please? I know that that is a short amount of time for us to get through all four career stages. The point of what we're going to be running through is that hopefully you can take any of this back and do it more exhaustively within your own organizations. So if an approach to career stage networking is something you want to do, then hopefully between your list and between my list, that gives you a place to start a conversation that you can go back and have in your own organization. So this is what would be on my list. In terms of what early career professionals are looking for from a networking experience, the first is the broad view, and more is better. Uh, I remember going to my first uh, SES conference and my first ASE conference and walking in knowing absolutely no one. And there it was, okay, how do I just start meeting people so I know who I need to know or where I want to go? You know, early career, you're not necessarily set or locked into one discipline or one focus area yet. So meeting a broader range of people is going to give you a better idea of what potential career opportunity and paths there are in the industry they're pursuing. As well as, depending who they meet, they may be actual to have some career mentorship there and some visioning. So in terms of the networking opportunities that you create, how do you set up those questions of those conversations? Also early career, sort of walking in a little clean slate. Who am I going to meet that are going to be my colleagues on this journey that I may have for the next few decades of my life as I pursue this career? And how do I meet those people? And then, if they're really lucky, they meet some Sherpas for that journey, right? People that have come before them, they're going to be willing to mentor and guide and draw the map and give them a little woolly hat when it gets too cold. <laughs> But if you're thinking early on, right, you're thinking broad. You're thinking if you were going to ask someone early career, who do you want to meet, the answer would be yes. <laughs> and that's what I would posit if you think about when you're programming those early career experiences, how are you helping them get past those first few moments of hello to have those, perhaps they don't all have to be surface level conversations, but to have those broader meetings. So this is what we're going to do now. This is a pattern that we're going to do for each of the stages. Uh, is that in a moment, Peter is going to introduce one of our panelists who's going to give you a few moments of narrative about how either they have experienced or worked within this career stage to set up a positive networking approach. And then I'm going to bring to you uh, at least one, if not two, we'll see how timing goes, of ways that you could elevate networking experiences in this career stage with actually doing an activity or two as a place to think about. And then we'll move to the next career stage. So that's what we're doing, so I will turn it to Peter. Thanks, Lowell. And as opposed to shouting across the room, we'll walk over here to Betty. How are you, Betty? I'm Peter. I'm Peter. <laughs> we're not role-playing. Breaking the ice here. So um, Betty's agreed to share a story around um, her experience with another colleague and they, where they were in their early career and how networking influenced them. So, you want to start? With sort of yes. Us a so, I, I'm Betty Wall, I'm the Director of Operations at AICHG, which is the Chemical Engineers. And uh, and we have, and I'm sure everybody here has for quite a while, been really working to get more young professionals involved in the organization. And I, I know that the common talking point these days is you've got to go where they are. Well, this is probably 10 years ago, and, uh, and I decided, uh, because of this also where I go to go where the young professionals were, which was the bar. And, uh, I, I, yes. <laughs> and, uh, and I wanted to start a program uh, for young professionals around the country. So I found this group of, of people that had come to a, a volunteer activity and started brainstorming with them in that conversation about, uh, you know, about really wanting to get uh, some input from them about what, what young professionals needed and how we could create a program and there were about five of them and all five of them ultimately in their experience of networking with me uh, became volunteers for the organization started the young professionals group uh, and ultimately went very you know some people went into programming for the organization some people went into leadership opportunities and i was just telling the world that one of those individuals actually became uh, a member of the board Ultimately, and uh, and and ran for president last year as well. So 
I, it's not so much what, what you know what I I do to get ahead as much as how they used me. Yeah. And over the years, those relations from that very first or seventh drink, uh, <laughs> they uh, they were able to always come back to me, get me to introduce them to the people they needed around the organization. And of course, for my own personal career, it never hurts to have a board member who owes you. <laughs> so it, so it, it worked out pretty well. Yeah, yeah that's excellent. I, I extract from that lots of benefits. Obviously, you were able to identify some early career professionals that were ultimately going to enhance the organization itself. But then that other kind of residual benefit, you had a friend that was <laughs> yeah, on right, the board level. Right. So, so yeah. it, really, it really ultimately, uh, and I'll just give you another very quick funny one, which is that when, uh, we were in Toronto for a meeting, I was working the booth, and a guy came up to the booth and really wanted that. You know, but he wasn't in, yeah, he wasn't really uh, a member, he wasn't doing anything, so I started giving him a little bit of hard time. Made him go through all sorts of ropes about what he did and who he was and, and all of that in order to get the bag. And ultimately, I gave him the bag and he turned around and gave, I swear this is a true story, tickets to the World Series that night in oh. Toronto. Wow. Because I had, I had engaged him so when he was standing around the room when nobody else was talking. So, you know, it works on a personal level. Wow. <laughs> so next, next exhibition, I'm with you. Yeah. Right <laughs> Thank you, Betty. So, if we're going to program uh, for early career professionals a way that's going to help them network besides introducing them to Betty with some drink tickets, <laughs> how else can we help? So I'm going to give you one or two ways to do that. Uh, and so let's talk about these things, right? You never have an event without a name badge. What is the purpose of a name badge? So someone else can see your name. Can you see my name? Back there? <laughs> nope. So often we structure badges to get like as much information as we can on there instead of just making it like your first name as big as possible. And then the stuff underneath, like who you work with or where you're from, if someone's close enough to read that, it's kind of in your personal space anyway. You don't really want that that close. So what can we do better in terms of like first meeting opportunities to help with this? So I would like everyone to take one of the post notes on your table. I put post notes on every table, so everyone take one. There should be a pad. If, we, if you've been using them to write notes on, I'm happy to share that was not why they were there. <laughs> Everyone take a post note. And what I want you to write on top of the post note is ask me about. And I want you to pick one thing. Ask me about what I had for dinner last night. Ask me about my trip here. Ask me about how I just got our organization's revenue from five to $10 million. Ask me about my pet dog named Spot. Ask me about why my kids are awesome. Ask me about what my hair looked like in 1988. Your choice. Pick one thing. Ask me about it. And write it on the paper. This is the easy one. All right, now, now I will say, typically among association executives and partners, we have your master level networkers, which means you'll find someone and want to like dive deep in conversation with them, because that's what we do. The purpose of this activity is service level networking. <laughs> so what, your goal for this moment, when you get up in a moment, is to go meet someone, ask them about it, but then move on. Right? So I'm going to give you a few minutes. I want you to try to get to a number of people. Don't just say with one person. All right? So take your post-it note, get up, and if you are this is the first time networking experience, now go try to meet each other and see how it goes. Stand up and go. Don't start with the people at your table. Go to another table. <laughs>
not talk to the same person. Keep going. Yeah, we'll see if we have time. activities, by the way, are to give you approaches to take back, not to actually let you do the full activity. So it's, it's think of it as a taste of you actually doing the full thing back. But if you had a name badge like that, does that get you past the first, what do you say, to start the conversation? Is that easy to do? Does that really cost you more money or prep time? Could you actually take that to your trade show floor of 500 to 50,000 people, and that would be a place for your vendors or sponsors to have a place to start a conversation of worth that isn't let me scam you? Yeah. <laughs> but for early careers, this gives a place to start the conversation. Um, now, I'd like to do just one more in this category because I think it's cool to see what, how you could do it a little differently. If everyone will take a piece of blank paper on the table, it should be a uh, piece of copy paper. Everyone will take one. All right. Here's the hard part of this activity. Line through the middle vertically, line through the middle horizontally. Okay, four quadrants. Draw four quadrants on your paper. I, I've had people hold it up and draw diagonally, or like not exactly the middle. All right, here's what I want you to do, you ready? Top left, the red quadrant. I want you to write in there, what was your first job in this industry? The red quadrant, the top left, what is your first job in the industry? Title or the I am leaving it to you. Okay. Even as a student, I, whatever you, whatever you feel your first job was. Top right quadrant, the blue one. What is your favorite food to either cook or to eat, but don't indicate which it is. So pick your favorite food to cook, or pick your favorite food to eat, but don't say which one you're picking. 
Okay? What is your favorite food to cook or to eat? Blue quadrant. So first job, top left. Favorite food to cook or eat, top right. Bottom left, yellow quadrant. What is a song that you find yourself singing in the shower or in the kitchen or in the car? And Despacito doesn't count. <laughs> What is the song? And if you're someone who doesn't really sing but hums, that's fine. If you're someone, everyone sings. But if you're saying you really don't sing, what is the song that when you hear it puts a smile on your face? Okay? Bottom left quadrant. What is the song that makes your heart happy that you find yourself singing? So we have first job, favorite food to eat or cook, song that you love to sing. Last quadrant, green one. Your first name really big, and then underneath it, what is a nickname that you've had? <laughs> yes. It's be Your clean. first name really big, <laughs> a nickname that you've had, <laughs> Betty, you can make it as clean or in between uh, as you know, like. That's a rough one. <laughs> if you have never had a nickname, just a little frowny face. Okay? You've never had a nickname, a little frowny face. All right, here's the rules this time. And because we have three more career stages to do, we're going to keep it short. When you go up to someone, you only can pick one quadrant to ask them about. You can't pick all four. So you only can pick one with each person. Number two, those of you that actually listened to my instructions and moved around, thank you. But I'll say for the rest of you, and realize you guys are master networkers at this. Do you know what happened to them? They listened to the instructions, they talked to someone, they left, they moved around, and went to find someone else. Because you all were engaged so much, they were left by themselves. Mm -hmm. So if you see someone who's actually following the instructions, get on these gold stars, and is moving around, welcome them in and don't let them be alone. Let's elevate our own networking practice here and welcome them in and don't have them wander. Try to get to as many people as you can in the two or three minutes I'm giving you, only one quadrant per person. Take your sheets with you. Don't start with people at your own table. Go have fun. That's some rules. Thank <laughs> you. 
please have a seat. Please have a seat. Please sit down. Please sit down. Please have a seat. Please sit down. Sorry for interrupting. Please have a seat. Please sit down. So let's say that you're getting early career professionals together, or it's a first timer, or an early career person at your conference. This one's a little harder to set up, but think about what you could do with it, right? I mean, for this one, you could have gone around and say, guess whether the person who picked their favorite food to eat or favorite food to cook, and see who gets the highest score, who guesses right. If we were at a higher level of comfort, I actually would have made you go around and sing the song. <laughs> Or for this one, if you found anyone that had a little frowny face, everyone had to give them a nickname. Uh, okay. Ways to help make those bonds, especially through gaming and through laughing, for early careers that will let them meet a lot of people. Easy to do, possible to do, not large lists to do. The ways that it's a lot better than just throwing them in numbers. So we did two with that one. We've taken up a lot of time, so we're going to move a little quicker to get to all four stages. Uh, so mid-advanced networking needs. You're talking about people anywhere from three or four years in the industry to perhaps seven to ten years in the industry, whatever industry you're serving. So I'll give you 60 seconds to 90 seconds to talk about quick brainstorm bullet point list. What do you think their networking needs are? Different than the earliest. Someone who's at this career stage, what do you think their networking needs are? 60 to 90 seconds to work with your brain buddy on that, and then I'll tell you what my list is. Go. <laughs> So this is what would be on my list as we're advancing, right? So at this point, they have a broader range of knowledge of what's within any profession or field, and they probably are starting to see what is the discipline or focus area within the field that I have passion for or interest in or that I may want to pursue. And so they're networking to find people with similar discipline or focus areas probably a little, little less broad and a little more deep, right? Isn't about how many people I can meet now, now it's about who's actually sharing where I'm interested in. I want to meet those people. Also, the competency level isn't just the intro level anymore. They want to find people that have mastery in those discipline levels. To network with, to connect with, to learn from, and also to learn with. At this point, they also have enough broader view of the industry that they, many of them will start to be able to become authors of visions for the industry. Perhaps that's visions of the future just for that discipline area. Look, this is when these hear those conversations of, you know, if we did this, this is what would make this process better. This is where, you know, futurists looking for our field of where we need to go. So you get vision authors there. And they're looking to start to form really more regular support through social systems. So it isn't just about keep in bringing in the new ones. It's about now when they come to the conference, it's who am I going to see that I've seen the past few years I'll get to see again. Who do I need to reconnect with? Who do I need to see in the hallway to have that conversation and catch up on to see what happened since last time? They have the people to sit with at lunch. So that's a little bit different than early career, right? They're a little bit more of a known factor, and they're a little bit more known of where they're going. 
So let's hear a brief story about that. So Mark. <laughs> yes. How are you? Oh, I'm fine. Thanks. Wait, well, Mark, will you stand up yeah. just so the people in back can see <laughs> you? I'm sorry about that. that. So do you have a story to share about <laughs> <laughs> some experience you had in my career? Well, yeah, I mean, we've, uh, in, in publications, uh, I was just having a conversation with my boss about, uh, who asked me if I wanted to do this, by the way, and I said, wait, you know I don't like people. But, uh, <laughs> but, 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 but you it, said you like me. Yeah, well, you, know, you say things. <laughs> but getting over that initial hump with people is a good, it's not stuff for me. But anyway, but that's just to get to this next thing, is that technology is changing so fast in the public. And formats, and, and we're generalists. We're not in, in my editorial group. We're, we're not, you know, we're not uh, IT specialists. Uh, uh, but we have to end up knowing a lot about that. So we have to to partner with people that you might meet here, you know, in or in other uh, uh, venues uh, to to get that expertise or to have them supply that for us. So, so, and so that's one aspect of it. And the other aspect is talking to other people who are in similar roles within other organizations to see what their experience has been, not necessarily with a specific uh, vendor or software or something like that, but but you know, what why are they going in certain directions and what are the distinctives about their association that makes that make sense for them and may or may not make sense for us. So Talking with my boss, and he said, well, "You know, we, we have to put together this web of information, this, this, this synthesis of, of information." I said, oh, "So, uh, so we're spiders, <laughs> yes. uh, well, well, uh, you know, spiders like damp, dark places like bars. So, <laughs> a good place to, to, to talk. Uh, but we're, we're having to synthesize information. So we've done that with uh, uh, programs for." Uh, for like e-learning, yes. you know, we, we've had to partner with people, but we get we get to that decision by synthesizing information from a lot of different sources, and that's the networking mm -hmm. aspect of it. That's the focused stuff, but with the broad picture of where we fit in in the industry, what's and how we serve our members best, because what serves uh, you know one society's members is not necessarily going to fit ours. Ours are very broad. Wide range of publications. So yeah. That's the story. So, so what I heard is using using your connections, uh, gaining perspective from others, and then sort of filtering them for your situation. Yeah, yeah. And we, we're in a position to make or influence or make those decisions. Yeah. And, and this is essential. For that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we'll just do one activity for this stage. You get to choose where you go. If you'd like to discuss membership, you're going to come up here. If you'd like to discuss meetings or conferences, you're going to come over here. If you want to discuss learning, you're going to come over here. If you want to discuss governance or volunteers, you're going to go back there. When I say go, you'll choose membership, meetings, learning, governance, or volunteers. When you get to your area, what I'm going to ask you to do, I know the first thing you're going to want to do the small circles you make is introduce everyone in the circle. If we have time, I will let you do that. I'm going to ask you to not do that for the purpose of this. What I would like you to do when you get to your circle is for one brave soul to ask a question in that area that they have on their mind or something they see that they want the group to discuss. So someone asks to bring up a membership point, why you chose the area you want to talk about, meetings or conferences, learning, governance or volunteer, if any area gets a lot of people, you can break into two circles if you want to. So choose which corner you want to go to. Go get with those people. You'll get three or four minutes to talk with them about the topic of interest with them. Thank you. Staying at your table is not allowed. <laughs> Membership, meetings, conferences, learning, volunteer coverage. <laughs>
Now, what's interesting about meetings um, is that I will see one of two things happen. Either meetings people get together with meetings people, so like this is what I do. Uh, or I've also seen situations where meetings people say, I want to understand what my clients need and yeah. understand more. Uh -huh. I'll actually will not go to meetings and will come to one of the other areas uh -huh. to hear what's going on. Please come back and have a seat. <laughs> so if we had time, if we had time, number two would have been to then have you stay in those areas of interest and to have you either pair up or work in threes. 
come up with within that area that you selected what excites you about tomorrow. What's excites you about the next five, ten years? What is the idea or an idea that you think would get people excited to join your group and to have you work on that as a discussion? Bring it back to why we did that in the first place. We're talking about people that have now started to find an affiliation for a particular track, for a particular topic, for a particular discipline. They want to meet other people that have that same interest. They want to talk about what they're curious about or where they want to grow or what they could build or create. You get as associations, people in your industry that come together that are going to discover and pursue all these disciplines, the one that exists today and the ones that will exist tomorrow. The more you're able to help them find those that have similar interests and passions and make those connections, that then helps them pursue their career and what they can do for the industry, the more return that you're making in terms of their time they spend with you. Again, it doesn't cost a lot of money to do it, they're already present. You can make, you can have some of those things happen virtually as well. Good? Number three, master executive level networking needs. So now we're talking about people 15 plus years in the industry. We're talking about people that have uh, elevated to the C suite or the senior VP, senior leadership team level. So I will give you 60 to 90 seconds. What's your bullet point list of what you think their networking needs are? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Tell you what's on my list. So this is what's on my list in terms of this career stage. At this stage, in terms of networking, they're really looking to have their kitchen cabinet. They're coming to the conference. They'd probably rather first go to dinner with their close group of people of 5 to 12 that they can go and actually both catch up at all times, but also I have one of these that I'm like, all right, here's the crazy idea I'm thinking about. Tell me all the reasons I'm wrong. <laughs> right? But you have that cabinet that will be honest with you, and you know they're speaking to you from a place of caring, and they know you. They form that. They've also become, in networking situations, often solution advisors. I've been in this field for a while. I've seen things that have worked and that haven't. It doesn't mean I know everything, but I can give you perspective on what are some solution paths to pursue. They also are looking for people that are success partners. They have a really clear vision of what success looks like and what they need to continue to succeed for their organization. What are the partners that we need? Not just industry partners or vendors, but also colleague, collegial partners that will help them get to that, that success. Often at this, space, at this stage, because you're going from here through retirement, right? they're also looking to network to give back. I've gotten so much from this field. I've gotten so much from this organization. How can I utilize networking as a way to help mentor others, to help guide others? As well as often networking here, um, they become industry in influencers. How is my voice during networking shaping what the association does, shaping where the industry is going? Time travel back 30 minutes ago. Early career 
networking versus this list? Night and day? Yeah. Do we throw people in a room all together and say meet each other with wine and cheese? Yeah. Yeah. Anna, how are you? <laughs> sure, yeah. So you're going to share an experience or a story uh, around a networking situation yeah. at the master level? Definitely. So I think what Lowell said, I definitely have started using my, my personal network more as like a sounding board. Um, like the, the specific challenges that I'm facing, for example, I just inherited our operations in India and China. And China, for example, I you know, didn't grow up there, I didn't study abroad in China, and you know, dealing with some of the, the cultural differences has it's, it's been uh, a challenge, fun, and I take it as an opportunity, but one of the first things I did was remember a few people that I've met along the way at several conferences, you know, we connected on LinkedIn, and then I instantly start reaching out to them, you know, specific issues, best practice sharing around not just a broad general, but it's more specific questions, more sure. hands on. So what I heard was um, when you're at this level, you have a very broad kind of network that you can access, right. and then you were very intentional in identifying the folks that can help or provide some background or guidance around this particular situation. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, Great. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Everyone has a playing card. I just gave it to you. And so what I want you to do is to find the match. Meaning find all jacks get together, all queens get together, all nines get together. So stand up. Find your matches. Sevens! <laughs> hurdle you're facing, or struggle, or quandary, or problem, that you get to share what that is. If you do not have a heart for the next three minutes, four minutes, you are now solution provider, solution consultant to that person. Okay? We're having a mini kitchen cabinet, a mini mastermind group right here. You have three minutes to help them solve that problem. Three minutes. Well, no, I think like, first Yeah, right. We're not just 
Back to their seats and didn't say this first, they get upset with me. If you're going to want to connect with these people on LinkedIn because this is now a nice conversation you're having, you either need to agree to sit together at lunch or exchange business cards, <laughs> or you've just formed a little micro community or mini cohort that you may want to stay connected with. So decide if you want to do that, and then please go sit down so we can. And then please have a seat. <laughs> All right. So let me have your let me have your attention back, please. Why do people belong to your organization? They belong to your association because within their career, within their job. They face challenges, they chase, face solutions, or they face potential opportunities that they want to find answers to. They want to find a solution for virus for. They want to find the information or knowledge from. If you as a member came to an organization, sat down, were able to present your problem, and then got five, ten minutes of just focused solution time, forget anything else that's presented in the content. Does that maybe tangible impact and value of why they belong to your organization? In terms of this career stage, it's a particular place in networking. 
being able to, you know, this was done randomly with parts, being able to align those people to be solution providers when you're at this senior stage with perspective. I not only have the idea, I have resources I can share with you that will help you implement the idea. It's hugely valuable. And all it takes, costs you to do is to actually set it up. We had had time, I also would have done a leadership activity uh, because at this stage we find leadership. So what is leadership values that you would express? What is your mantra? Then how do you like to be led on the other side of mind? Job seeking, networking needs. Uh, I'm not going to give you time to brainstorm because we're almost out of time. Uh, and you can go back and ask. But when you are in job seeking mode, oh, did I skip the slide? I put it in the wrong order. I All right, what are you looking for? Well, once you're in job seeking mode, right, what does my resume look like? Help me update it. Help me tell me what works and what doesn't. Actually, help me prepare for an interview. Do a mock interview with me, uh, especially if you're jumping levels, right? Interviewing for a director position, interviewing for a COO or CEO position is not the same interview. If you've never actually done a full search with a recruiter before, that interview process is vastly different. So interview prep doesn't matter how many jobs you've had at least. Connections to recruiters and hiring managers. When you're in that networking situation, you're looking for the person who's in the know and what jobs are coming out or available so they can keep you in mind and you want to stay on their radar. LinkedIn updates and recommendations. How am I building my online profile so that's not only the piece of paper they receive, but that it actually demonstrates the achievements I've been able to succeed in. And when you actually get the job offer, this is the stage, you're like, how do I actually negotiate, right? So if someone's making, do I actually tell them how much money I want? Do I tell them above how much money I want? Do I tell them below but say that's it? How much do I account for benefits in that? Do I think long term? We do this so infrequently, we're never a master of negotiation for our salary and benefits, and this is the time when we need that. <coughs> so you may have a different list. These are some of the things on my list, but if you're programming networking for people who are seeking jobs, this totally changes how you're going to program networking opportunities, right? So Matt. <laughs> yes, and I do have a story to share. <laughs> Please, take it away. <laughs> Uh, uh, I, this has been a great session. First of all, thank you for keeping it interactive. Uh, I think that there's a lot of value that, that came out of this. Just being able to demonstrate networking, and I think you can't get a practice what you preach, and then you don't want that. Thank you. Uh, when I think about networking, one of the things I think about is it's not digging the well. You always have to be digging the well. You're going to need water, but you just don't know what you're going to use it for sometimes. Sometimes you need it to drink, sometimes you need it to bathe. Sometimes you needed to put out a fire. And how many fires have many of us had in our careers that you need your network to help with? Sometimes you don't know what you're going to be for. And uh, from my experience, I was actually in the middle of an executive director job search about five years ago. I was about to leave an association. Uh, I was with SAE for uh, 12 years. When you get to that position, what's the one thing when you, you build 12 years of one organization that you might not be able to get a hold of? It's references. Because everyone you've ever worked for is in the same organization. So I was very fortunate, well, I'm just fortunate, but uh, uh, Bob Chopper from NACE uh, had just left SAE, and I reached out to him for a reference. And immediately he said, yeah, absolutely, I'm going to give you a reference. The next morning I got an email that said, what are you doing? What's going on? <laughs> Don't take that job. You have got the job. Four months later, I moved to Houston and worked at job. You never know what's going to happen with your network. You never know. Um, I had a great run at NACE, and I was actually offered um, an opportunity to take on a CEO role and, and would be assuming the CEO role for the American Public Society in January. So here I am again in the same situation when I'm going through the interview process. I had this great mentor, and I don't want to, I can't use him as a practice. The same guy that got me the job at NACE. I'm <laughs> explain that. And so I had to go back to, to one of my wells. And I can tell you, I had to go to references that were actually from SAE. Two of them are at this conference, and one's in this room. That's Kevin Perry. I didn't, I didn't plan that, but Kevin was one of my references for the, for the AWS job. And so flash forward a little bit, I've been at AWS uh, six months. They've, they've extended the CEO contract to me. And to go back to that slide that you were just showing, I've never had a CEO contract before. I don't know what the heck I'm doing. I don't know what the heck I'm looking for. Who's the first person I saw? Bob. 
hot chocolate. <laughs> what's your, what is your contract? What are the things I should be aware of? And actually, there was one thing in the contract that wasn't in there that I fought for that, was, that actually protected me because I spoke to that person in my network. It's, an, it's just so important to have that opportunity when you're talking to people, when you rise to the level of the C-suite, you no longer come to these, uh, to these events to find your next employment opportunity because the people that are hiring aren't here. They're the board members, they're not here. These are the people who will help you prepare for that executive search and for that interview. So uh, I think that uh, one of those things is paying it for, and, and Bob did that for me. And that's one thing about him and the other people that stayed in my network. So it, it was a, a really, uh, really great pleasure to have that opportunity and to be a part of that journey. That's my story, just take me through it. <laughs> Thank you. I know better than to take away from lunchtime, so let me just tell you what the networking activities would have been. I wanted to do a little interview insights. Many of us do run mock interviews for our members. I see some associations actually do that on the trade show floor as a place to do career development to get people to come there. But if you do that, have you ever thought about running sort of the mock interviews by where you want to aspire to be. So there's gonna be mock interviews for C-suite mock interviews, for senior leadership mock interviews, for mid. So someone doesn't only have to interview at their level, they can have a mock interview for whatever they aspire to be. That's something interesting. Uh, another is that any of us that have experience in our careers have the ability to ask reflective questions as a pseudo-career coach as well. Now those that have better listening abilities, of course you're better at it, but I could have paired you up to ask some of these questions. And there's enough collegial care that you would listen with an open ear, hopefully, and an open heart, and be able to reflect back some of what you heard. <coughs> facilitate the questions, facilitate the format, and you can actually do career coaching as a networking activity to at least have someone have the conversation. So we have one, and I'm being very unfair because it's 12 or 1. <laughs> So, Kevin, do do? I, yeah. is that all right? Is that okay? So, yeah, so it's a great story. Yeah, and, then story. and then we'll wrap the session right after that. Yes. Last thing. My buddy, you guys. So my story is a bit of a departure from what we've been talking about in terms of leveraging our own networks for, for our career advancement, as well as all the great information about networking opportunities we do for our members and customers' minds about creating a networking opportunity for, in my world, what turns out to be potential buyers. So I'm with SAE's professional development group, which obviously puts on all the training and professional development courses. We love to meet HR training people, right? Those, those really turn out to be our advocates and, and in many cases our buyers. So what I've been doing for the past two years, every six months I convene a group of automotive HR training professionals under the heading of Training Professionals Networking Group. So first and foremost, we bring them together to provide a network building and information sharing opportunity for them. But our agenda, of course, is to get fresh information about what's going on with engineers and their companies, what kind of talent development issues we should be aware of so we can keep our program relevant, and for me and my staff to build network with those individuals who can be potential consumers of our courses. The other thing I'll mention real quickly is the U.S. Chamber of Commerce has been busy deploying a program called Talent Pipeline Management, which is a methodology around bringing together what they call collaborators of employers who agree to work collectively on a talent acquisition or a talent development problem, skill shortage problem, uh, that they're having in their particular industry segment, and they um, they agree to work together to diagnose, do needs assessment, and come up with competencies or training needs. Then they invite in the training community to educate them about what they need and invite them to make proposals to do training. And then there's a whole evaluation and incentive and reward uh, uh, set of uh, guidelines they follow in terms of keeping that group of uh, training providers relevant. So, for those of you in the training business, if you get wind of any of these employer collaboratives, you, you should really make an effort to get plugged in as a training provider, because I think we'll be seeing more and more of these around the country. 
Thank you. So today we did by career stage. But that's not the only way you can slice and dice in terms of how you set up your networking opportunities. My hope is that you are walking away with at least some questions to take back and some discussions to have, with some ideas of how you could take the times you bring your members, your stakeholders, your partners together and help them get past those first few seconds of hello to actually make more meaningful relationships. The better that you become the platform and the home for those relationships, the more those people are going to feel loyalty to your organizations and stay involved with them. There's a lot more we could have discussed and a lot more we could have played with, but I appreciate you going for a outside the normal just sit and actually get up and play session. Uh, I hope we worked up an appetite for you for, for lunch. Certainly if you want to discuss this more, any of the career stages or anything else, feel free to connect with Peter or I on LinkedIn or get our card up here. Happy to, I'm not sure the slides have much information on them, but I'm happy to share them if there are guidance for you. Hope you have a great rest of the time. Thank you.